surface of this planar disk, right? Just a nice, smooth surface disk. And we didn't worry about where we were writing, right? We, we worried to the extent that, yeah, we have a sector and a track. We, the, the, in the track dimension, we worry about where we're writing. But we didn't worry about where we started writing or the timing. Right? We simply write over the top of old data, write over the top of it. We don't care. We don't do any timing whatsoever when we're doing our recording. Now you say, well, how can that be so difficult? Well, the difficulty comes because we cannot, it's also impossible to read during write. That's because if you write, you put a pulse into the head, it generates such a large impulse of electromagnetic energy that your read sensor, whatever you're using, will be essentially driven to saturation by that, that you know, write pulse. So you cannot read during write in any practical scheme that I have seen to this day. Um, and so that means you then have to rely on your sector servo uh, for giving you the timing. All right. So then, okay, well, let's see what timing requirements are if we're going to do that. So this is the problem. We've got, you know, you have to have the right pole over the bit in order to do the recording. If it's a little early or a little late, it won't write the bit appropriately. Right? In fact, if you get too far too ahead or behind, you might write the, adjacent, the next bit instead of the one you're trying to write. Um, so timing becomes quite critical. Well, how, how bad is it? Um, there are various sources of timing errors okay, that are possible in the disk drive. And this is a fairly simple analysis that just says, let's assume that these various sources are all Gaussian. Okay? They have a Gaussian variance in terms of their statistics. That's probably not a bad assumption, right? Most things in nature tend to be Gaussian uh, in terms of what you look at. So if you have a Gaussian, you know, Gaussian uh, probability, then the probability of a timing error is given by that equation up in the upper right, just one minus the error function of the, the bit spacing over two divided by the square root of two over the sigma. And so then, well, what's, what's the sigma? Okay. Well, there are three big sources, three sources for the timing uh, variance that you're going to have. One is the switching field distribution of the individual little islands, right? The anisotropy or the coercive force of each of those little islands is not identically the same. We know when we make a magnetic material, there's variations from place to place on the disk, right? There is today. And there's certainly gonna be when you make them little islands too. So there would be some variance in the anisotropy, so that will give rise to a switching field distribution. Right? One island will switch at, you know, HK1, and the next island will switch at HK2, all right? A little different value. There's also a variance due to the fact that if I've got one bit, it's surrounded by, a, it has a bit ahead of it, a bit behind it, and then it has a bunch of bits to the side of it on the adjacent track. And one thing I cannot control is what those adjacent bits are. Right? So each of those adjacent bits is a, you know, creates a magnetic field, a demagnetizing field, which affects the localized field at the bit that I'm trying to do my recording on. So, you know, if all the adjacent bits are pointing up, then I'm going to have a strong field downward in the center of the bit in the middle. 
if all the adjacent bits are pointing uh, downward, then I'm going to have a, <laughs> a field which is pointing up in the middle. And so, you know, there's an interaction field between, for the adjacent bits, and you realize that I don't have any control over those because that's, it's, this is random data, right? So I've got to allow for any combination of bits on all the adjacent bit locations. And then there's also a distribution due to dot spacing fluctuations, right? This is the lithography term. The fact that lithography isn't perfect and, you know, the, the, the edge of the bit will have some variance in its position. Now, I, I would point out that in principle, I could imagine making a material with perfectly uniform anisotropy, right? I mean, I can, I can work toward that as a goal. I mean, I, I know I'm never going to achieve it, but in principle, I could improve my manufacturing process, keep getting better and better, reducing this one. And I can also, you know, make better and better lithography tools and continually reduce the lithography variations. Okay. I can't do anything about this one. So I'm stuck with this one no matter what happens. Because I can't control what's on the adjacent how, how, bits. How, how big is it compared to the other two? The, this is what I'll show you. <laughs> Basically, this is a plot of uh, the distributions. Now, this is a contour plot, okay, of what is required. So this, on the vertical scale, is the spacing distribution the lithography, we have built into the model, okay, the interactions, okay, and that's, it's of the order of 5%, okay, the interaction field numbers are 5, 10%. Um, the interaction fields are taken into account in this, and so this is a contour plot plotted in bit error rates, okay, so these numbers shown on here this is 10 to the minus 4 bit error rate, this is 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 10, so forth, okay? So that's a bit error rate at a given anisotropy field variation or, uh, you know, uh, lithography variation. And what it says is, you know, in, in disk drives today, we'd like to be at about 10 to the minus 6 raw bit error rate on the disk. This is, you know, then with error correction codes, we correct that up to 10 to the minus 14, 10 to the minus 15, something like that. So that's what you need at the system level is, is the corrected bit error rate. But, but today's codes, which are, you know, not the most powerful codes, we might be able to push it a little bit harder uh, than what, you know, certainly in optical disks, uh, they commonly use 10 to the minus 3, uh, you know, they use codes that will correct to 10 to the minus 3 with cross-interleaved Reed-Solomon codes and things of that nature. Um, but if you look at this, you see that, gee, if I need something of the order of 10 to the minus 6, then I'm going to be somewhere around 5% sigma is tolerable, right? It says I can work right here where that white dot is, about 5% sigma on the anisotropy field variation, 5% sigma on my lithography. Now, those are doable, but just doable. <laughs> I mean, these are, these are not, you know, I mean, that's a tight sigma for lithography. And it's a tight sigma for anisotropy variations. Okay. Not impossible, but it doesn't make the job very easy. So this suddenly becomes a big air issue for bit pattern media that we never had to contend with in magnetic recording before. Now, this is some work 
actually done at the Data Storage Institute in Singapore, um, where they have, you know, they have a, built a very nice uh, test bed uh, for servos. Uh, it's a simulation test bed, if you want to think of it that way. And uh, it enables us to analyze, or enables them to analyze, whether the servo will actually perform under the circumstances that we're asking it to do. And basically the analysis here says that we cannot use a bit aspect ratio of one, I'm sorry, a, a bit, a, yeah, a bit aspect ratio of one, which is what would be required if we were trying to do one to one, you know, minimize the lithographic requirements, which I think we'd like to do. It basically says that you can't get the servo to close, be, at least with the normal sort of specs, which is a 10% uh, sigma for track misregistration. So that you can't use, you know, that's another bottom line comes out of this is we're not allowed to use a one-to-one -one bit aspect ratio in bit pattern media. So we've got to tighten the lithography spec anyway from where we were. So the current thinking, I think, within the NSIC community has been that we would shoot for about a two-to-one bit aspect ratio, not four-to-one. And to calibrate you, current drives are probably around six-to-one, okay? Two to one is quite a bit smaller, but two to one seems to be a reasonable compromise. And at two to one, they can just get the, the servo system uh, modeling to appear as if it would close. So that seems to be a compromise. But now what happens two to one, what that means is that we would be recording elliptical bits. Okay, so we'd, we'd be trying to make ellipses with a two to one bit aspect ratio. But remember what I told you earlier, and that is currently we don't believe we can make the masks solely by e beam lithography. What the most effective way, cost effective way of going forward was viewed to be to combine self assembly with e beam lithography. So now this adds a complication because self-assembly is pretty good at making little cylinders and getting them to align. But now we have to make little ellipses and get them to self-align. Whole new, it doesn't say you can't do it, right? It's possible that, that you know, this will be worked out, but things are becoming more and more and more complex as we look at bit pattern media trying to get the whole system to seem to fit together. So, yeah, I, I already made these points, I think. Um, you know, the patterning process seems to be a convergence on e-beam plus assembly, plus self-assembly and nano and print as the only viable cost-effective uh, approach that could succeed in the short term. And bit pattern media needs to have hot, the other, yeah, the other thing that I haven't talked about is that bit pattern media, the, the bits are getting so small now at, at the dimensions we're talking about, even at the, the, you know, if we get to terabit, terabit and a half with perpendicular recording, then, you know, all right, maybe we introduce this technology, we want it to work at, say, four terabits per square inch, all right? Well, at four terabits per square inch, we're talking about a 12 and a half nanometer bit cell, and that means the bit island itself is six and a quarter, right? Six and a quarter nanometers. Well, it turns out that if you have a six and a quarter nanometer island of magnetic material, if you want it not to be super paramagnetic, you can't write on it with an iron cobalt head. So 
even if you do bit pattern media, you're going to need some write assist. Okay. So what you're forced to after we're all done is that bit pattern media really looks like it's tough from a cost effective point of view of putting the whole system together. Moreover, when you're done, you come to the conclusion you still need some sort of write assist in order to be able to write on it. So, you know, I think that it's unlikely that bit pattern media is going to be the next technology that we see for magnetic recording. Um, although the staggered BPMR pattern might enable a, a wider write read head, it poses the same TMR requirements as bit aspect ratio equals one and the timing requirements of bit aspect ratio equals four. So that's, it's, you know, the staggered bit thing, though clever, is not a solution. It, it does enable you to relax the lithography on the head, but that is all. As I said, that's led to the conclusion that uh, we'd like to have elliptical bits with a bit aspect ratio of two. Um, developing lithography and microfabrication processes with less than 5% tolerances on dimensions is a significant challenge. Switching field distributions less than 5% are not demonstrated in bit pattern media, okay? and are not understood. We really don't even have a good understanding of the switching field distributions that have been observed in uh, bit pattern media islands at this point in time. Uh, cost, it was estimated that converting just 10% of disk media to discrete track media or BPM by 2012 would cost $650 million in capital and equipment, which sort of suggests that if you had to convert 100%, you'd need six and a half billion, right? So this is, a, you know, this is a big issue for hard drive makers. Um, and then, of course, developing a planarized, reliable head disk interface is also a challenge. So based on all those, I'm pessimistic for bit pattern. So let's turn to the other one, hammer, or heat-assisted magnetic recording, or, yeah? Uh, before you go to hammer, Dr. Platter, one question on the previous slide. Uh, for the switching fields, less than 5% variance, do you think the inventions are more in the material science area, or just the processing? I'm sorry, invention of what? Inventions to reduce the switching field distribution to less than 5%, is it more in the material science area to develop new materials, or is it more on towards processing of existing materials? In terms of the If I understood your, your, your question, I think that, that um, yeah, repeat the, it one more variation, time. The variation in the field of uh, yes. the problem, and you say that it's not well understood, is it because we don't understand the physics of the behavior? Correct. Correct. Okay. Yes. It's, it's because we don't understand the physics of what is giving rise to the switching field distribution in the materials that have been looked at. I mean, um, and this is a statement by Hitachi, okay, who have, uh, you know, Bruce Terrace, um, who's made, you know, they've made quite a few. They've done um, various materials, cobalt, platinum, multi-layers, and others, and the, the, we're observing large switching field variations, variations from island to island. It doesn't seem to be, you know, just island to island interaction. It, there's some, it's, there are things going on which are causing the threshold for the switching to vary which are beyond what we would normally expect. And, and, you know, it's just not understood at this point exactly what's happening. If you don't understand the physics, uh, can we just do cheating a little bit, just give the bias signal to cover it? Get, uh, back, back bias signal to cover the, the randomness. 
campaign? No, it, it gives you too much of a, I mean, you're still having, it doesn't help to bias it a little bit, because you'll still, you know, it'll still vary from island to island. No, there's nothing, the, 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 the thing that, you know, the most attractive thing would be, could one, can one get, make a material with, you know, exchange coupled composite, you know, layers, lower the switching threshold sufficiently, okay, by using ECC type media, and thereby enable it to switch without requiring some heat assist or microwave assist or something like that, that might give you a better chance of being able to do it. But, you know, this is, this was, the reason I put this up here is it is one of the issues which was flagged by Seagate, WD, and Hitachi as being things that they wanted to fund INSIC to do in order to solve the problem. Because we really don't understand what the switching field distribution is that we have right now. We don't, you know, it's not easy. I don't think anyone has, one of the problems is we don't have a good way of measuring the variation in anisotropy from place to place on a disk. I mean, you don't, even in today's media, right? And what Hitachi did was just look at, you know, if you apply a field, how much variation do you get on these little isolated islands? And they see huge variations which they don't really understand at the present time. So, you know, there's more work, fundamental work on the physics that needs to be done. Okay, so Hammer, as I said, going in, I mean, it, it, it is my favorite, um, but, you know, <laughs> I, Running INSIC, I've actually been able, I think I've been quite successful in being very balanced in, in leading the, the technical program, trying to just look at the technical issues in these things um, and, and look at them. So let's talk about Hammer. How does Hammer work? Um, well, the problem with, as I pointed out, is that the head doesn't have sufficient field to write on the media if we keep reducing the grain size. <clears throat> and we've got to keep reducing the grain size if we're not going to switch to bit pattern media, otherwise our signal noise ratio would degrade too much. So how do we do this? Well, we have, fortunately, a lot of magnetic materials with huge anisotropy. Cobalt platinum, L10 cobalt platinum, uh, even L10 manganese aluminum, uh, and certainly L10 iron platinum, uh, and a lot of other materials, will produce higher anisotropies than we can write with today's heads. And in principle, then, those would enable us to go to smaller grain size. And we could, you know, we could make a media in principle that would not be super paramagnetic, that would be thermally stable with very, very high density recording. That's the origin of, you know, I, I, mean, I wrote a paper long ago that said in principle we could do 50 terabits per square inch. I think Terry McDaniel subsequently published one and said in principle we could even do 100. And I think that's, you know, if you take the smallest grain size and try to, you know, look at it, just from the point of view of what would thermally be stable, those numbers are correct. Um, the problem then is that we've got media that looks like this. We've got a corrosivity, which is very high because of the high anisotropy. And, you know, you plot it versus temperature, you can heat it to the Curie temperature. And of course, if the Curie temperature, of course, it goes away. The problem is the available right field is much less than the coercivity. So you've got media which would have gigantic anisotropy or gigantic coercivity and would be thermally stable if you could write the bit, but you have no way of writing it. 
Well, hammer, the whole idea is use heat to assist in the writing. So you heat the media, you write at or near the Curie temperature, you allow the media to cool down after the write process, and then you store the media. Okay, the data is stored at room temperature, so you have thermal stability, um, and there's you know no real problem in terms of uh, you know your super paramagnetic effect and thermal stability of the recordings. It's a simple concept, not necessarily so easy to implement. Um, <clears throat> This is a cartoon of what heat-assisted magnetic recording might look like. Um, what's shown here, with the exception of the laser beam and that little planar waveguide, dielectric waveguide in the gap of the head, this ought to be look pretty uh, conventional to those of you who, who work in the heads area in uh, magnetic recording. In that, you know, all I'm showing is a thin film, in, you know, head with a GMR sensor behind it, okay? Uh, conventional sort of structure. And the only thing that's been added is we've put a dielectric waveguide through the gap of the head, and we've coupled a laser beam into that uh, dielectric waveguide uh, via a grating at the back of the waveguide. And then that, what we do is we focus the light to a small spot here at the air bearing surface of the head, and that then heats the media, and by heating it, we can now then record with the conventional right poles that we have on the head. Very simple sort of concept. Um, I'll show you in reality what some of these look like. Um, this is a chart which has its origins from Mark Ray. Um, Mark gave me these slides to use at TMRC because he bowed out at the last minute giving a, a talk and needed somebody to stand in for him. Um, and, uh, you know, what he was arguing is that, look, uh, he was trying to address the question of whether Hammer has reached a, a critical mass or not at this point in time in order to uh, move forward as a technology. And these were a list of things. The first three were things that he had on his chart uh, as being what was necessary in order to uh, prove that the technology was viable uh, and had a critical mass. And, and the first one was a mass-producible integrated head and media which is compatible with existing industry capital investments. All right, and that's important, okay? That's distinct from bit pattern media, for example. And is extendable to greater than one terabit per square inch aerial densities. Okay. Um, in addition to that, his argument is we need an efficient near-field transducer. You realize that at 25 terabits per square inch, again, we're talking about a 25 nanometer bit cell, uh, even at four to one bit aspect ratio, four to one bit aspect ratio, that would imply the track width could be 50 nanometers, but your bit length would be six and a quarter, okay? Um, so if you, I'm sorry, 12 and a half. Um, so you then, at the, even at that dimension, so 50 nanometers is your track width, that's still, still well beyond the diffraction limit of normal light, correct? Uh, diffraction limit which you can focus light is, you know, something like a half lambda or something like that. Any reasonable wavelength laser is gonna be a, <laughs> considerably larger than 50 nanometers. So you need a near-field transducer because you want that heated spot to be confined to your track width. So you need a near-field transducer at the end of your 
your dielectric waveguide in order to give you this small focus spot. And then cost um, effective mass producible light delivery system. When I started the hammer program at Seagate, um, I think we all felt that the near field transducer was probably the most challenging aspect of making hammer work. Um, today, I don't think any of the companies feel that the near field transducer or whatnot is the showstopper. <laughs> and I, I think that everybody, you know, and I, I think I can say that for Hitachi, WD, and Seagate is my perception. They all believe that we can make near field transducers that will work. Um, the cost effective mass producible light delivery system is one which well, I initially thought, well, that's just engineering. <laughs> okay. um, but that was partially because I was a little bit naive about how difficult it is to, to uh, fly at these kind of fly heights and, and maintain track uh, misregistration budgets on servo and things of that nature. And, uh, you know, when you really look at it, I mean, we were visualizing actually building hammer heads sort of like that cartoon that I showed, which was, you know, coupling light into the thing on a grating, and that's just impractical on the drive. We visualized hooking a fiber optic uh, cable up to the, the head, and, and that's impractical, not because you couldn't in principle do that, but because the fiber optic cable is more massive than a wire. And although we can hook wires to a head, we really can't hook a fiber optic cable to it because the mass is too big and we get too much vibration and, and flexing and so forth transmitted to the head and we'd have both TMR and probably HDI problems as a result of it. So I think the only viable solution is probably to integrate the laser right into the slider in some sort of fashion. And that's been a problem which, because we didn't see it, you know, I didn't see it, none of us at, at you know, at research at Seagate at the time saw that as an early first order problem. We saw the near field transducer as a bigger issue. We didn't address it early on. I think it's getting attention in the companies now. Uh, I don't know exactly where they are, and I'll talk a little bit about, you know, some of the things we've done at, at uh, CMU to address it. Um, but that's one that needs to be looked at. Yeah. Could, could you please go back to that cartoon this one here? Uh, I could see clearly that's how you put the heat in, but how can you remove the heat out? Huh? The heat, the, the, it's really not a problem. This is a, uh, depending on what you've done down here, you'll, this is the substrate and you put it, you can put a heat sink in here. It turns out if you do the do the calculations of the thermal thermal mechanics that's in there, this is a very small very small spot. The total amount of heat you're introducing is in the hundred microwatt range. It's actually dissipating in the in the disk. So it's a very small amount of heat in the disk. And if you've got a you know the the film that you're heating is only five to ten nanometers thick. But you put it on a heat sink, which is, you know, some fairly good conducting metal, you dissipate the heat very quickly. And in fact, the, the, heat, the heating and cooling can take place in the order of 150 picoseconds. Okay, so the, the cooling process has been measured, literally, uh, to be of the order of 150 picoseconds. So if you want it that fast, you may not want it that fast for design reasons, but, but you can slow it down easy enough by but not <laughs> using quite such a good heat sink. So, so that's, you know, that's not an issue. It's, everyone always wants to know, I mean, if you talk about heating and cooling, people think of it as being slow, but time constants we're talking about are 150 picoseconds. So, this is not an issue. Yeah. Uh, how about the mid-size 
size depend on the lighter pole size or the laser beam size? I, the, this doesn't limit us at all in disk size. The, the, disk, the disk size issue, in my view, is simply one of capacity and sweet spot for that desired capacity as we go forward. I personally think, I mean, we're, you know, I think today probably we're roughly a crossover between two and a half and three and a half. I don't know exactly what the specs are. Sorry, Mark, sorry. I mean, bit size, data bit. Because you say the grain size is about 12 nanometer, right? Right. Or uh, one uh, terabit per square inch. Right. So the, the, the bit, data bit size. Oh, the, the bit size, the track width? Yeah, correct. Oh, well, I, that's what I was saying. At a terabit per square inch, I mean, probably ought to use two. Uh, let's, but, let's say two terabits per square inch. Well, a terabit per square inch, that's easy to use because I know those numbers off the top of my head and then I'll scale. Terabit per square inch. The bit size, we, what, we would, what I would put forth is what we want to do is a four to one bit aspect ratio, right? Of that order. So, so, so then that means we'd have a 50 nanometer track width, okay? And we'd have a 12 and a half nanometer bit length. Now you got to think of this heated spot just the way you think of a right pole. Yeah. Okay. And so you would write with it on the trailing edge, just like you do on a right pole, right? You have a long right pole and you're doing the writing on the trailing edge as it moves away from the media. And so the, you could have a, a, heated spot, which is 50 nanometers in diameter, okay, full width, half maximum, that would enable you to write a one terabit per square inch uh, disk at an aerial density of one terabit per square inch. And, and your, you know, total, and then, and then, you know, yeah, you'd probably need you know, grains of the order of six nanometers or something like that in order to have adequate signal noise ratio. Yeah, because you look at the, the uh, lighter pole and the beam size, how to match to the, to light the, the That's the near field transducer, and I'll show you that. Okay, and the only one Mark didn't put on his slide is the one I added at the end because I, this one always comes up and we need to always be mindful of it. Uh, hammer, we're heating the disc. If we're, you know, using most of these materials, we're going to heat to several hundred degrees C, okay? A few hundred degrees C at least. Uh, so we, you know, and standard lubes uh, will decompose at a few hundred degrees C. So there, we do need good work, some of which was done before I left Seagate, but, and I would hope that they've done more since then. Uh, and so I'm optimistic that this can be done at least for the first generation or two of Hammer Media, but I don't think this is necessarily a problem we can ignore. I think we have to face up to the fact that we need a reliable head disk interface at these high temperatures. So this is one of the Seagate slides. This was the solid immersion mirror uh, approach, which Bill Challoner et al. did while I was still there at Seagate. Um, and the, the concept, this is put into that dielectric waveguide that I was talking about. And we got a, a, a dielectric waveguide. It is shaped in the form of a parabola. So it's made in a parabolic shape so that it focuses to a small spot. And we bring the light in, it focuses to a spot, and then, you know, imagine that you've lapped off the bottom of this uh, parabolic shape so that, you know, this is lapped off and you focus right at the air bearing surface of the head, okay. Um, this shows a picture of it and you can see the gratings that are in the uh, material for coupling the light in. 
The way that works is you've got a, a grating, the parabolic uh, solid immersion mirror, you shine light on it. That light is coupled down, focuses down onto the air bearing surface, and you know that provides the heat. Now, that doesn't get you a 50 nanometer spot. Okay, so I haven't answered your question yet, but I'll get there. Um, you can integrate that with the rider simply by putting it in into the right head, okay, in the gap of the head. And this is a picture of one of probably an earlier version of, of Seagate's integrated rider. Um, and so if you look at this, it looks a lot, I mean, those of you who know what thin film heads look like uh, in cross-section, this looks a lot like a conventional thin film head, uh, which is one of the nice features. Uh, this is not going to cost a lot more money to make the heads. Uh, it, yeah, you got to put down a dielectric waveguide and you got to do another lithography step and perhaps some etching to do the, you know, define the solid immersion mirror and the grating on it and so forth. But <laughs> there are so many steps in making a thin film head uh, that I don't think this is going to add significantly to the cost of, of making the head. Um, so, this structure is, is very doable. Um, this is an old slide. This is one from back when I was at Seagate um, and shows an initial pole design that we utilized. Uh, the top pole has actually steps in it, which I will tell you we learned very quickly is not a good idea. <laughs> uh, but it, it did serve the function for the early demonstrations. And what you see on the right is an optical image of the light coming out uh, from the dielectric waveguide in the head. Now, since I left Seagate, <laughs> uh, they developed this, this particular design. The early designs we were working on uh, used just a, a small pin a uh, little needle at the air bearing surface in order to concentrate the light as a near field transducer. Subsequently, after I left, Bill Challoner developed this lollipop design, uh, which is a basically a, you know, that's planar, but it's a, a circular, you know, the plane is in the same as the screen. It's circular, and, you know, most work in the early days with surface plasmons where people were trying to get high res make high resolution microscopes and so forth, a lot of the early studies were done on spheres, little gold or silver spheres. And so this is util and, and spherical di dimension in two dimensions, which is what you're going to when you go to the planar waveguide, is of course a circle. And so that is what he was utilizing, but then he took advantage of what's known as the lightning rod effect by putting this little sharp point pin down at the bottom of it, and the name lollipop obviously applies. And so it is this sharp tip at the end which gives you your spatial resolution during the record process. So this is what's put into the solid immersion mirror right at the focal point of the parabola. And here, then, is a more modern-looking pole, okay, uh, with the peg off the lollipop, the handle on the lollipop, if you will, pointing out uh, in the gap of the head. And, yeah, I think this is mostly here just to say and show that, indeed, they've, they've put one together and integrated it uh, on, into a... Uh, actual device. This shows a, a more advanced picture of some of these. Obviously they're making these on wafers uh, in, you know, thin film head form these days. Um, so, yes, they're making large numbers of these uh, since you, 
I don't know how many thousand you get per wafer, but obviously it's, it's many thousand. Um, now, what can, you know, let's look at the scalability of these designs. Um, basically, this is the aerial density that Mark Ray was projecting um, as a function of peg width, okay? And what you can see, assuming you work at, but I, I don't think we'll go to a bit aspect ratio of two, so I think you can forget about that one. Uh, bit aspect ratio of uh, four or six uh, would say that you can get into the sort of two and a half to four terabits per square inch range directly with hammer um, with a you know peg width of 20 nanometers, which is not too unreasonable, okay? 20 nanometer, I mean, I, I, last week I was in Japan and uh, we were talking about near field, non, I mean, sorry, non-volatile memory technologies and, you know, 22 nanometer uh, is sort of next generation stuff for the semiconductor industry. So this is timed fairly well with regard to what one would expect to have available for lithography tools for making it work in, and in the time frame that, that we need it for production. Um, I'll go through, we, we've been doing some work at CMU on, let me just click through. Um, we've been doing some work on near field transducers at CMU as well, and I'd just like to point out some of this. Um, what we're proposing is that one ought to look at using a near field waveguide in analogy to what Seagate, I mean, yeah, what Seagate has been doing. But we're proposing an alternative approach to making the near field transducer, and that is to put two waveguides, one of which is the dielectric waveguide, and the other of which is a, a little pin right adjacent to it. You can think of those as two coupled waveguides. Okay. And what happens with this design, I'll skip that, Here's the, the picture of the dielectric waveguide. If you position a needle very close to it, appropriate, at an appropriate spacing, you can actually get coupling between the dielectric waveguide and the needle. And so, and then you put your air gap out here. And what you want to have happen then is that you launch your light into the waveguide. There's a surface plasmon mode index in the, in the needle, which is matched to the waveguide mode. Power couples from the waveguide into the surface plasmon mode on the needle. Power travels down the needle as a surface plasmon and is transferred across the gap and into the media. So basically that's the picture of what's going on is that, you know, your grating was back here, your light comes in, you've got this mode which is set up in this waveguide, that energy all transfers to that needle and then ultimately goes down into the media, producing the, the spot. Now, the design that we've been doing is a triangular shape for the needle. That's not too hard to do fabrication-wise. Um, and the dimension of your actual spot, it turns out that if you design this way with a triangular waveguide, most of the plasmonic resonance occurs at the top of that triangle. And so, 
this is what the energy pattern is like as it comes out of the needle. You do have some residual energy in the lower corners, but most of the energy is at the top. Um, it is possible to totally suppress those in the bottom, I would point out, by putting a high index material near the bottom of that triangular uh, shaped needle. And so you can get rid of that if you wish. So anyway, this, you know, just want to point out that there are other designs, and Hitachi's published on other designs, uh, Sharp has published on other designs, a number of people are working on it. I don't think we've yet gone to the optimum near-field transducer, at least I don't know that we have. 